Hello, and welcome to Episode 70 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. We are here today with Maryland Delegate Pam Queen of District 14, also a professor at Morgan State University. Pam, how are you doing today? Fine, how are you, Jordan? Great, glad to be here. The first question I'd like to ask you is what are you currently doing or what have you ever done to advance the public interest and why? Well, um, so some of the things I've done in, in terms of advancing the public interest, mm -hmm. uh, I would say probably some of my advocacy before I became a delegate. I'm very active with several affinity groups and trying to make sure folks are involved and engaged in voting. Sure. So I do a lot of um, get out the vote activities with my sorority and mm -hmm. different groups. So that's probably some of the things I do to make sure people are just interested in the, in the political process and mm -hmm. aware of things that may be available to them. So those are some of the key things I think that I've done that have been helpful. So you were involved in advocating for particular legislation in the state legislature? You were involved with the, with the League of Women Voters? Or who, who were you involved with? So some a little of both. So I work with the League of Women Voters. I've been involved a little bit with them to try to, again, educate uh, the public. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, just recently we had a forum over in... Um, at Praisner Community Center, mm -hmm. and so I was involved with trying to get some of the community groups out, mostly the groups of color, so I got my sorority and different organizations. What sorority are you in? Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. Alpha Kappa Alpha, and is that is there any association with that sorority? Um, well, it's, it's one of the sororities, one of the, uh, the first... Uh, African American sorority founded at Howard University. Okay. And so we are committed to our motto is service to all mankind. Hmm. And so we're involved in all aspects of helping the community, but one a key piece is to make sure we're involved in voter registration, voter engagement, and that sort of thing. Okay, so what have you been doing with Alpha Kappa Alpha to do voter engagement in Montgomery County? So we have, um, we do voter registration drives mm -hmm. as, as one of the key things that we're involved with. We, ch we typically will partner with another group to make sure we're getting out the vote. Mm -hmm. We'll do voter um, sort of education type of things. We kind of work with NAACP, especially when we had the new voting machines. And for um, our listeners, the NAACP is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Yes. So why is this even important? Why do you, why is it important to to increase voter registration? Why is it important for people to vote? A lot of people, they don't think it's important to vote because evidently a lot of people don't vote. So how would you speak to somebody who says, you know, I, I don't really think my vote matters or I'm not really interested or why should I vote? How do you respond to someone like that? So my first response is that your vote does matter. Um, it's, it's a little easier, I think, for me in terms of the communities that I'm working with to really talk about how important it is for people of color to vote. Um, so we can talk about how, you know, when people vote, some things change or we see these changes that occur. What changes would you want to see? Why is it particularly important for people of color to vote? Well, it's important for people of color to vote. I think one of the, the, the key things I try to bring up since it's been one of the, the things that have been in the forefront mm -hmm. is important to vote, especially on local elections. Mm -hmm. We think about the fact that um, you vote for maybe your state's attorney general, mm -hmm. okay? And so you think about a place like Baltimore mm -hmm. where, you know, whether you agreed or didn't agree with the process regarding um, Freddie Gray's death and police being, should they have been prosecuted or not. If you don't have a person um, that's voting, that you voted for, that thinks like you think or mm -hmm. thinks some of those things are of issue to you or that you can even call to make sure that they think some of these issues are important, um, that, that's why you vote. You want to make sure someone's there that listens to you, understands your issues, want to at least weigh things uh, both ways or weigh things so that they consider some of your concerns. So you, you mentioned um, that there ought to be someone in office who would respond to your call. Is a, In your opinion, have politicians been more responsive to people who have voted than people who have not voted? I think there is some correlation there that maybe that shouldn't be the case, but certainly when you see that uh, uh, constituents that are involved with voting, constituents that are active, that mm -hmm. get out the vote, they tend to be the types of communities that people will talk to and make sure that they're 
you know, that their concerns are addressed. Because the, again, as a as a uh, as a elected official, you know, I'm going to respond to people who who help to get me in office. So if I want to stay there and I want to help them, mm -hmm. I'm certainly going to take their calls and listen to them. So I think that is part of the process is getting to know people. And that's one of the things that we advocate too as part of sorority. You know, one of the things we talk about is letter writing campaigns. Get to know your elected officials. Make sure that you're on their mailing list and so that you're talking to them and meeting with them. So, but you also find yourself having to represent the whole population, sure. which includes babies, but they never could have voted for you. And of course, I'm sure you're very much in support of public education, sure. although 100% of the recipients of the education, or all, nearly 100%, are under the age of 18, which means 0% of them voted for you. Yet you still advocate for their interests. So there's a lot of the population. There could be Republicans who didn't vote for you in the oh, primary, sure. Sure. and there could be people. And of course, you can't tell who voted for whom in the general election, just if they voted or not. So how do you, you said that you want to be responsive as an elected official to those who support you. How do you find yourself being responsive to those who didn't support you? And alternatively, uh, be, um, you know, Governor Hogan right now is a Republican for the whole state of Maryland, mm -hmm. yet he represents you and you are a Democrat. How has he been responsive to those who didn't vote for him into office? So you and then him. Well, so I, I, I don't want to give the impression that, right, that you should only uh, cater to people that vote for you. Certainly, I'm just saying that that is certainly a way that can grab your attention, right? The people are going to listen to you if you've mm -hmm. been active in, in the process. Mm -hmm. But certainly, um, all the issues that, that are important to me are issues that that I live, right, mm -hmm. or, or, or that my constituents talk to. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to be a Democrat for me to know that you're concerned about good schools. Right. Right? You know, I, I say that education is one of those things that hits everybody the same way. You have one opportunity to educate your children. Yeah. So everyone wants good education. Good, having good education, having um, people that can contribute to the economy is important. So that's just important for us in terms of, living here in Montgomery County, living where we are, to make sure that things are better for everyone. So um, I, I advocate for people because there, those are good things to do to just to make living a lot better for myself and others around. So they're just they're key issues that are going to be germane and important to me as well as others, regardless of our political background. So what are some of those key issues that you found during legislative session and, and just generally um, that your constituency asks you to represent them for? So uh, certainly education is, is one of those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, people are concerned about choices in their education, being able to make sure that they, they can have um, some say and in involvement in terms of how the students are, 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 are cared for and, and making sure we have students who maybe have disabilities that we're providing kind of coverage and, and support for those sorts of services. And what can the state legislature even do about that? Well, I mean, we, we work with we work with the school board. We work with making sure funding is available for construction in schools, mm -hmm. so, so we can help with those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's one of the key the key pieces that we're involved with. You mentioned disabilities. Can the state legislature affect individualized educational plans? Well, we 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 can definitely make sure funding is available and working with the federal government to make sure different programs and funding is available. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some legislation we're probably going to look at to make sure that we have sufficient funding for, um, you know, uh, not just K through 12, but, you know, early education sorts of programs, mm -hmm. um, making sure we have uh, funding for our farm students and making sure we have Sort of uh, just to interject for a moment for our listeners, farm doesn't refer to agricultural students, <laughs> it true. refers to students who are eligible for a free and reduced meals program, right? Which is an indicator of poverty, it's an indicator of poverty. And so, we found out that some of those you know that that number has been growing in, in Montgomery County. Matter of fact, I uh, heard of a number that says that the number of students who receive uh, free and reduced meals. Uh, rivals the entire population of public schools in Washington, D.C. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's how I responded. Right. And so, you know... What does that say to you? That says to me that we have a major problem with, um, you know, feeding, just feeding our students. How do we expect our students to achieve if we're having issues with um, just having the basics, right? We have, so, so that's... 
that's fundamental into making sure that we have, um, you know, the facilities and resources. So education is a top priority. So that's the top priority for everyone. Well, right? What other issues are you finding? And, and so, you know, once we, we, we have good education, mm -hmm. that tends to provide people want to move to areas that there is good education. Mm -hmm. right? And so that helps us with attracting people to the community. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we can bring in uh, folks that will be involved with with the community, helping make sure we have good jobs, mm -hmm. that we can sustain those sorts of families. So that's another piece. I think those are very much, those are very much tied to 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 Maryland and, and you know and making it such a, a great place to be. So I hear you talking a little bit about the interplay between the state of an educational system and economic development and job growth. Mm -hmm. Now, you actually are a part of the educational system, the higher educational system, as a professor at Morgan State University. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about what you're teaching and how you got to that position and how that position informs your views on education policy in the state legislature? So, I, I happen to, um, I'm a professor at finance at Morgan State University, so that's in our school of business. So, again, um, just in terms of the nature and the types of, of, of classes that I teach and, 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 and the involvement with other colleagues, mm -hmm. we're also, you know, we're also called upon sometimes to help with economic development or how can we revitalize an area. So I may be involved and I am involved with some initiatives in Baltimore and telling them how do we bring growth into the area. How can the university in terms of its placement in the community help you know, help bring that community up. For example, mm -hmm. um, I, I ended up doing my master's work at John Hopkins, but if you look at John Hopkins' presence in Baltimore and how it's helped that community, mm -hmm. right? how it's helped with uh, bringing business to the area, mm -hmm. helping to make sure housing is you know affordable and, and plans like that, a, a university could help really shape a community, and that's what we're really trying to do at Morgan, is really shape that community hmm. in terms of being a resource for small business, entrepreneurs. Have you been a resource? Yes, yeah, so we help with um, know-how in terms of helping to do business plans. Um, I've worked with um, some of the, it's a program called Maryland Challenge, hmm. where you can have uh, young entrepreneurs get business grants, and so I do some of the mentoring and, and the reviews of some of those business plans and huh. provide some support on how they could get better, even if they don't win the challenge that year, well, how, what can they do to get better? So so that's kind of what you want a university to do in a community in terms of helping it to, you know, help it to, to thrive and help it to grow. So that's kind of one of the parts of things I do in, at Morgan as part of just being part of that community. We have a program called the Morgan Mile where I serve on that board with others. What and is the Morgan Mile? So the Morgan Mile was again the, the vision of, of the university to see how could Morgan help this 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 community within the mile radius of itself. So that's not you know not just in terms of business development but within education. Mm -hmm. um, how the, can they help with um, we have people who focus on helping them work with the government to get like solar panels put on their homes, hmm. helping them to, you know, just to, just to, just to pretty much navigate and build that community up. And so, why is it important for an institution of higher learning um, to include in its mission improving the welfare of the community in which it's situated? I think it's important because you're you're there. You're a part. You're part of the community, mm -hmm. and so. But but also, you have resources that should be helpful. I think to the community, right? And especially if you're in a community such as Morgan, you know, within you know an urban area where you you can help that area. I mean, it's important. We live there. We're we're part of their partners. We, so Morgan has resources, and since Morgan has these resources, which could be of use to the local community. Um, there's a responsibility to open up access to the community mm -hmm. so that they can avail themselves of those resources. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, exactly. So, and, and I think that's part of our mission um, as an HBCU, but uh, historically black college and university. But I think that's the mission of, of a lot of schools. You're seeing you're seeing more of that where uh, schools and, and companies as well are looking at this social responsibility sort of a viewpoint of things. We don't just exist to make profits. We don't just exist uh, 
um, because we're you know, an institution of higher learning. We exist also because we're part of the community and we should be helping the community. Earlier in this conversation, you mentioned the importance of helping individuals of color register to vote. <laughs> you just mentioned that you work at a historically black college. What is the significance of Morgan State University being a historically black college? How does that influence its mission, influence how the students are taught? How does it, how is it different to be at a historically black college as opposed to any other school in the United States? Well, I think you, you, when you teach at a historically black college, you do understand that your, your, your mission is to, um, you know, build people or, or, or build graduates that, understand the, their role and the importance of giving back, being integral into the community. Um, you understand that... Is that uh, tied into the black narrative or experience in the United States, or is it just something particular to that school? No, I think that's part of the greater black narrative, and, and when, if you would have a discussion about why, you know, why should we still have historical black colleges and universities, I think it's still important because they help to... Um, Produce a group of people that can help uplift, help uplift that 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 culture, help uplift others in that you know in that kind of among people who are much like us, right? People Interesting. So if so, basically, it seems like it's providing many role models within the African American community for younger African Americans, and that the idea is if an African American individual were to go to a historically black college, graduate, and become successful, then uh, that alumni base will be helpful and inspirational to the next generation yes. because he looks like me, she acts like me, mm -hmm. she started in similar situations as me, and look where she was able to go. Exactly. Is that basically what you're telling That's me? That's exactly. We're basically, you know, showing them how to, to live the dream, right? So you have the dream and we're showing you how to live the dream. And that you don't have to leave your culture behind in order to make the world better and advance yourself professionally. Oh, no, yeah. That's, right. the, okay. that's basically... The mission. Okay. Okay. That's could be the mission of the, the university. So you've been a professor, and you've been and, and and you've been an advocate, and somehow, and then now you're you're a delegate. Can you talk a little bit more about the path you took um, throughout your life, the narrative of public service that brought you first to historically black college? Did you grow up around here? Let's start with that. Sure. So I grew up in in Washington D.C., mm -hmm. and so I, I grew up. Uh, I say I'm one of the, the, the children of the, the 60s movement in terms of seeing it, but from a very young, very young age. Um, what so, did you see in a young age? Well, I, so I grew up basically, like I said, the, the, the late 60s. Um, I'm, I attended a church where the pastor was from Morehouse College. I don't know if you're familiar with Morehouse College, but that's the same college that Martin Luther King went to hmm. and, and was a contemporary of his. And so um, so I saw as in a young age this this involvement of church and community and, and just how people organized. And that was appealing to you. It was. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was appealing and it was very interesting to just to see how how change was done. And there's it, an energy to those communities, it, isn't it, there? It's, it's very much an energy tool. It's a very much an energy, and just see how things are done, and and just how people, how how again, just how change occurs, right? You just you're seeing you're seeing people be involved. You're seeing people talk about their their experiences. So I mean, I I I, I was always so intrigued by just the, the sense of government. And then when you go to the school and. In, in Washington D.C., like our school trips are to the capital. Our school trips are to. Yeah, how many kids in the, the world get to do that? Right, it's right. right. So our school trips are to the Smithsonian. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember the, the time when my school trip was to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, that was the most fascinating place there. But 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 one of the trips to the capital, um, you know, we're we're listening to the you know the the the. the the, the tour guide. The, the, no, not so much tour guide. I mean, we listen to a session oh. where they're actually voting. Oh, okay. And You're in the gallery. You're in the gallery, and and so they're voting on on this issue. They're voting on NATO. They're voting on the NATO bill. And so the next day, to wake up in the morning on your front page of your your newspaper mm -hmm. to see. You know, this is what I just heard about assault. For our listeners, um, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, so it's just to kind of like see that and mm-hmm. live that, mm-hmm. that, that made it sort of, uh, sort of interesting to me. So I, I don't think I just thought about, okay, one day I'll, I'll be a legislator, but it was just always something that was important to was me. Was interesting to yeah, you. Yeah, just something that was there was interesting to me to be involved and just to see how change is, a change occurs. And how did process. you evolve to be an activist? Well, I think it's just because of, you know, the church being involved in so many things. And um, I had the experience when uh, I was involved in one of the uh, local community groups to talk to um, some of the students who were part of the student movement, mm-hmm. um, some of the SNCC students. and they What were, does that mean? Now, SNCC, they, and then that one, I don't know exactly. That's the Student National Coalition. They were the student group that was involved in the civil rights movement. Hmm. And so they were the, the college students who did the sit-ins mm-hmm. um, and, and did all those sort of things. Uh, Congressman Lewis is a, is, is a, um, from, from Atlanta, mm-hmm. Georgia. He's, he's one of those, he's, he's someone from the SNCC time frame. Um, hmm. Jesse Jackson mm-hmm. was one, Marion Barry. They all went to so the it's an outgrowth of the civil rights movement. They, they, were the, they were the student college folks who were involved. And you were involved in this organization? No, 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 no. no. I, was, I was young. I'm still young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a young I'm a little younger than them. Yeah. But I met some of them doing, um, when they, they, were, they came to the Washington area to, to work or whatever, mm-hmm. um, I was involved with like the National Council of Negro Women, which is a, a, a involved group. And so many of them worked with worked it within those organizations mm-hmm. and I would listen to their stories about mm-hmm. how they would organize and do things and that's kind of how I got involved with activism through listening to them and just talking about how they did stuff it was it was it was interesting okay and well we're nearing the end of our podcast here Pam so as we do I'd like to ask you to think about your years of service and the inspiration that you drew from others and speak for a moment about how you hope your life would be an inspiration to others to perpetuate the movement. You spoke about historically black college producing graduates that would inspire younger generations. You spoke about previous generations inspiring you. How do you hope that the next generation will be inspired by the work of you and your generation? So I'm hoping, and I think I'm seeing a little bit of it now, um, certainly being involved with the, the, the Maryland legislature, um, and, and there are not many African Americans from Montgomery County, and, and right now I'm the only female there. I've seen a lot more folks seeming to want to get involved. Mm-hmm. Um, so building this pipeline mm-hmm. of other young women, and, and not just African Americans, but women of, of color across the board, just mm-hmm. women in general, um, getting more involved. So I'm seeing a lot more of that. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing people take a lot more interest in, in the issue, especially at the local level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, very often. Um, you don't find people that, that are that knowledgeable about what's going on at mm-hmm. the local level. So right. I think that's helped just being there kind of has helped to inspire others. I do take the time to meet with various uh, youth groups to mm-hmm. talk about the political process. I've met with, um, uh, there's a youth group that we work with from Germantown Elementary School that uh, mm-hmm. some of my affinity groups we work with, I did a, a session on the legislative process with them to kind of just talk about how things yeah. things occur. And, we, and I just, you know, we, we did this little, uh, it wasn't so much of a skit, I, I told them to talk, I told them to look at the pros and cons of why we should have seatbelts on a school bus. Mm-hmm. And so we had one side to say they were for it, and one side to say they were against it, and then they did like a mock rally to talk about mm-hmm. the issues. And so, and it's funny because, you know, we just had an accident not too long ago where now, this, you know, people are sending me emails like, oh, that was such a timely topic to talk mm-hmm. about. But we've gotten to sort of the, you know, why, you know, it, you know, this is a safety issue, but we got to balance calls, we got to look at, you know, what it entails in terms of changing the configuration of buses, you know, and how would you advocate for that? You know, would you, you know, would you go write letters? Would you go have a rally? Mm-hmm. And so we talked about those sorts of things in terms of, you know, making them more involved. And I think that's kind of sparked some interest in terms of that as well. So Pam Queen is somebody who uh, has a great focus on education being within the context of the community in which the children are being educated, the perhaps adult students are being educated, 
and in which the university or the school is located. For Pam, community is incredibly important. Education is but one component of that community, and they're all interconnected. Education can lead to economic development, and economic development will bring more individuals into the community, which will again uh, add more property values and revenues, which, as Pam can do in the legislature, could take those revenues and allocate them back to the school system. So it's a very interconnected world, and Pam does the best she can, uh, drawing inspiration from those who came before her to perpetuate the process of public service and giving that same inspiration to those who will come after her. So, Pam, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And this has been Episode 70 of Public Interest Podcast with your host, Jordan Cooper, where we interview politicians, activists, advocates, and others who seek to improve the state of the world. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.